On the screen we have the table of measurements of capillary diameter and length for equipment that works with R404A refrigerant with a capacity of 100 BTU per hour, initially working at minus 20 degrees Celsius, that is, for a low temperature application. Now the interesting part of the matter begins, when we make the following comparisons. The following measurements are obtained from the first row. With a diameter of 0.24 inches, the recommended capillary length is 5.7 meters. Let's look at the measurements for a capillary with the same 100 BTU per hour, but now with a temperature of minus 10 degrees Celsius, that is, for a medium temperature application. This means that we are increasing the temperature, but with the same cooling capacity. With a diameter of 0.24 inches, the recommended capillary length is now 6.48 meters. When we make the comparison between both capillaries sought, we can notice that when we need to increase the temperature of the evaporator, with the same cooling capacity and capillary diameter, then the capillary must be lengthened. So if we need to increase the temperature even more, but with the same cooling capacity and diameter, we should have an even longer capillary. Let's check it in the table. Now, with the same 100 BTU per hour, but with an evaporator temperature of minus 5 degrees Celsius, with the same diameter of 0.24 inches, According to the table, a length of 7.51 meters is required, that is, longer than the two previously searched capillaries. We are going to carry out the second analysis, but varying the cooling capacity. Now, we are going to go from a cooling capacity of 100 BTU per hour, to another of 150 BTU per hour. So looking in the corresponding table, we now have 150 BTU per hour and minus 20 degrees Celsius, with the same diameter of 0.24 inches, a length of 3.33 meters. We are now going to make the following comparison, going to a cooling capacity of 200 BTU per hour, at the same minus 20 degrees Celsius. With the same diameter of 0.24 inches, the recommended length is now 2.35 meters. This means that when you have the same evaporator temperature and the same diameter, if you need to increase the cooling capacity, then you must decrease the length of the capillary. As a first conclusion we can say that the change in capillary length is very useful to calibrate the evaporator temperature at any value. In addition, changing the length of the capillary can serve to slightly change the cooling capacity, but in small variations, as in the case of the examples, where the increase was only 50 BTU. Now, when it is necessary to switch to a very different cooling capacity, the change in diameter can be more useful than the same change in capillary length. At this time we must mention that the best way to select a capillary is not precisely with the electrical power or horsepower, but with the cooling capacity of the compressor. This happens for one. Compressor cooling capacity is the amount of heat that a piece of equipment running a given compressor can extract, usually measured in kilocalories per hour, BTU per hour or watts. Here we must emphasize that the watt is the unit that can present confusion, because it can be used both to measure the electrical power of the compressor motor, and to measure its cooling capacity. 2. You must take into account that the cooling capacity is always taken as a function of an evaporator temperature, which is why it is a more precise parameter than horsepower alone. On the screen we have the average cooling capacity table for a 112 HP compressor. 
Although each manufacturer performs tests to indicate these cooling powers, we can generalize by saying that these capacities will be very close to the values we are presenting. As we can see in the simulator, the cooling capacity for equipment with a volume of less than 95 liters is precisely that belonging to a 112 HP compressor. On the screen we have the average cooling capacity table for a 110 HP compressor. As we can see in the simulator, the cooling capacity for equipment with a volume of less than 147 liters is precisely that of a 110 HP compressor. On the screen we have the table of average cooling capacity for a 18 HP compressor. As we can see in the simulator, the cooling capacity for equipment with a volume of less than 216 liters is precisely that of an 8th HP compressor. On the screen we have the average cooling capacity table for a 6th HP compressor. As we can see in the simulator, the cooling capacity for equipment with a volume of less than 280 liters is precisely that belonging to a 6th HP compressor. On the screen we have the average cooling capacity table for a 5th HP compressor. As we can see in the simulator, the cooling capacity for equipment with a volume of less than 430 liters is precisely that of a 5th HP compressor. On the screen we have the average cooling capacity table for a quarter HP compressor. As we can see in the simulator, the cooling capacity for equipment with a volume of less than 559 liters is precisely that belonging to a 1 quart HP compressor. On the screen we have the table of average cooling capacity for a 1 third HP compressor. As we can see in the simulator, the cooling capacity for equipment with a volume of less than 1,000 liters is precisely that of a 1 third HP compressor. At this time it is important to mention that a compressor in order to develop its cooling capacity needs a capillary tube that is also selected for that same value of cooling capacity, either in BTU per hour, kilocalories per hour or cooling watt based on the working temperature that the system will have, both in the evaporator and condenser. On the screen we have the tables of pressure and temperature of the refrigerant R404A. To facilitate their use in various regions of the world, these tables have been prepared in different units of measurement. In general we can say that R404A is a refrigerant with high working pressures. R404A is used in refrigeration and freezing equipment. Let's look at the pressures present in these teams. 1. Low pressure, present in freezing equipment, for a temperature in the evaporator of minus 20 degrees Celsius, about minus 4 degrees Fahrenheit. Here we have an absolute pressure of 45,276 psi. To note the low or evaporator pressure that the manometer would mark, we subtract the atmospheric pressure from the table value. In this way, 45,276 psi is obtained, minus 14.7 psi. This subtraction results in a manometer pressure value of 30,376 psi. 2. Low pressure, for refrigerators, which work with a temperature in the evaporator of minus 10 degrees Celsius, about 14 degrees Fahrenheit. Here we have an absolute pressure of 64.68 psi. To note the low or evaporator pressure that the manometer would mark, 
we subtract the atmospheric pressure from the table value. In this way, 64.68 psi is obtained, minus 14.7 psi. This subtraction results in a manometer pressure value of 49.98 psi. 3. Low pressure for conservation, without freezing, which works with a temperature in the evaporator of 5 degrees Celsius, about 41 degrees Fahrenheit. Here we have an absolute pressure of 104,811 PSI. To note the low or evaporator pressure that the manometer would mark, we subtract the atmospheric pressure from the table value. In this way, 104.811 psi is obtained, minus 14.7 psi. This subtraction results in a manometer pressure value of 90.11 psi. 4. To know the high pressure of a team that works with R404A, simply use the room temperature, increased by 15 degrees Celsius, and look for the pressure value in the table. For example, for an ambient temperature of 35 degrees Celsius, we increase it by 15 degrees, to obtain a value of 50 degrees Celsius. Here we have an absolute pressure of 337.365 psi. To know the high pressure or condenser, which would mark the manometer, we subtract the value of the table, the atmospheric pressure. De esta manera se obtiene 337.365 psi minus 14.7 psi. This subtraction results in a gauge pressure value of 322.665 psi. 5. Now we have the pressure of the equipment being turned off, which the manometer would show. We subtract the atmospheric pressure from the table value. In this way, 237,552 PSI is obtained, minus 14.7 PSI. This subtraction results in a manometer pressure value of 222,852 PSI. 852 PSI. Since the computer is now turned off, both the high and low pressures would read the same, with a value of 222,852 PSI. At this time, we must remember that RM-404A is a refrigerant generated with a mixture of RM-134A gases, plus RM-125, plus RM-143A. Because it is generated by a mixture, RM-404A must be charged in a liquid phase. The fact that RM-404A contains RM-125 and RM-143A, both with high global warming potential, also generates a high GWP blend. VP. Although RM-404A does not destroy the ozone layer, the fact that it has a GWP of 3920 causes it to currently have problems with environmental restrictions that regulate those gases with GWP greater than 2500. Gracias.